Hello, hello and welcome to Classics Now. Uh, this is the opening event of our new festival, which is going to run um, over all of this weekend um, online. Um, it's, it's about presenting the work of contemporary artists and writers who are exploring and revisiting uh, the Greeks and Romans and their art, literature and ideas, and reimagining them in ways that shed light on our world today on our contemporary preoccupations um, and challenges. Over the weekend, you're going to see and hear from theater directors, choreographers, writers, critics, uh, dance artists, visual artists, and filmmakers um, who are reflecting the current kind of surge of interest in, in classics and in, and in the ancient world, which is um, apparent in, in all sorts of ways in our culture at the moment. Um, we are online only now for this weekend, but in the future, we are aiming to get back out into the, out into the world, off our screens, and to have live performances, to have exhibitions, particularly of art and architecture, um, and he here, in, here in Dublin. Um, but one of the great advantages, making the most of this situation that we're all in, is that um, this event, because it's online, can have um, a huge um, international audience, which we have this evening. So thank you for joining us. You're very welcome. Um, and I am really happy to present our two authors this evening. Um, and they are Daniel Mendelssohn, who is joining us from New York, and Sebastian Barry, who, well, he's in Wicklow, he's a little bit closer, closer to home. Um, we are we've brought them together because we know that they are have a lot that they're friends and that they have a lot there's a lot of overlap in their work um in his recent collection of essays daniel mendelssohn wrote about his desire to to revisit the greeks and romans and their culture and to to bring them alive um and to also think about what our interpretations and adaptations of their work, what, what it says, what it says about us. Um, Daniel Mendelssohn is a distinguished critic, a memoirist, an essayist, and he often in his in his essays he combines personal narrative um, aspects of memoir as well as his acute uh, literary analysis and. I think particularly so in his beautiful memoir that he wrote about reading Homer's Odyssey with his father, his late father, and how his father joined his class, uh, his students at Bard College, and sat in on a semester where they explored the Odyssey, and, and eventually, which I think brought them together in all sorts of ways, and eventually they even, they even went on a Mediterranean cruise in the footsteps of Odysseus and their relationship survived that, which is pretty extraordinary. So, uh, Daniel, it's wonderful to have you here. Um, um, Sebastian, Sebastian Barry uh, has been uh, honoured by the Arts Council of Ireland as Ireland's laureate, laureate for Irish fiction. And that is for, um, well, his body of work, his plays, The Steward of Christendom, The Prayers of Shirkin, Our Lady of Sligo, his novels, Whereabouts of Aeneas McNulty, a long way, way, a long way, a long, long way, um, and many others, where he is, I think, very much concerned with uh, untangling complicated allegiances and identities, and rescuing figures who have been lost in the shadows of history and reclaiming them, bringing them back in into the light. Um, I think, thanks to his his insight, his kind of curiosity, and his empathy for these often quite lost characters um, that he brings he brings to us. Um, Sebastian studied Latin uh, at university, and uh, we were just talking about that. And he um, has returned, I think, as a touchstone to um, Virgil's Aeneid many times over the years. I know it's a, it's a very important text. For him, so I think we can we can be sure that this conversation between these two writers will will, will probably touch on um, the epics, uh, Homer's Odyssey, Virgil's Aeneid, and also the, the the afterlife of these of these texts in 
in Western in Western culture. Um, the conversation will will touch on many many other things, but I think uh, I, I'm looking forward to to hearing both of their insights on those on those aspects. Um, you will be able, you, our remote audience, will be able to uh, contribute by sending, you can type in your questions for Sebastian and Daniel on screen uh, while they're talking. So you've got about 40, 45 minutes to compose your wonderful questions, and uh, compose your thoughts. I'll be able to read them, I'll see them on screen, and then I will share them with Daniel and Sebastian later. So we'll have a QA and a we'll open it up. Um, and that will that will be uh, roughly 45 minutes time. So that is that's all for me for now. Um, I'll be back then. And for now, I'm going to to, to hand over uh, to Sebastian Barry. Sebastian. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, beloved Daniel. Hello. In Derry Nam, another Derry Nam, uh, yeah. which is the name of your house in New York. Uh, rather wonderfully. Uh, mm -hmm. You may be aware that in the early 19th century, when Daniel O'Connell was living there, uh, there was no path to his house. You had to come along the strand. And if there was a storm, you weren't going to get there in time for tea. And I always think, talking to you, uh, that we are always going along the beach. And the reason is, mm -hmm. um, in my view, you are such a magnificent scholar, for, apart from anything else, which I never was. Um, I studied Latin and English at Trinity because as a very odd 17-year-old, I had read Matthew Arnold, who advised every writer to have a classical education. So that's why I did it. I could not read or write English till I was about eight, and I had huge trouble with Latin. And one of the magic things, uh, although I saw, I'm so glad I did, May engage in that struggle. One of the beautiful things in your work when I was reading through some of the, of the books again was the way you describe your understanding of Greek, your kind of passionate um, uh, understanding of Greek, apprehension of it almost in, in, in the fibers of your being. Mm. I wonder, could you talk about that? Because that's something, it would be the opposite of my experience with language. Well, it's interesting. I, so I was probably just as strange an adolescent as you were. Um, and from a very early age, I mean, I think probably going back to nine, eight or nine, I was already deeply interested in Greek mythology, um, Greek history. Uh, but it wasn't until I went to university uh, that I actually started to learn Greek. And it was very curious because everything about Greek, and as you know, people know, Greek is a difficult and highly complicated language. Everything made sense to me. Everything made sense to me. It was like remembering rather than learning. And I don't know whether it was because I was just primed, because I was already interested in the culture, the myths, but every grammatical principle, I remember thinking, oh, well, you know, of course it's that way. So I always felt that my connection to the language was so profound that it sort of paved the way for everything else. Language is very important to me. I Three of my four grandparents were immigrants, so I grew up in a house where many languages were spoken, Russian, Polish, German, Yiddish. And so this sort of idea that um, I remember my grandparents would switch languages depending what subjects they were talking about. Um, and so the idea of language as a key, as a key to a, a secret door that would give you access to a culture was, I think, part of my DNA from a very early age. And so when I started learning Greek, it just all made sense to me. And I think I just felt this tremendous affinity. As you know, um, in my first book, uh, which, you know, as Helen said, in, in I've now written four, I guess you could call them memoirs. I'm not sure what the right word is. I sort of try to entwine personal histories with 
considerations of different aspects of classical culture. And, you know, in Greek, there's this um, grammatical tick, you might say, where there, there's two what's called particles, untranslatable syllables, and you insert them into sentences to give them balance. So it's sort of like on the one hand, X, on the other hand, Y. And X is the syllable that's pronounced men. And Y is the syllable called death. And that made so much sense to me because it seemed to explain something about my personality, you know, or maybe everybody's personality, which is you're always sort of one thing. And yet you always feel that there's more to you. And so I just keep, kept feeling that there was something about the Greek language that was descriptive of my life almost. And that was really the beginning of everything for me. It's uncanny though. And I mean, genuinely uncanny uh, in, in a properly Irish way. Um, you know, um, in Brian Friel's play Translations, mm. the schoolmaster in that play, in, in trying to engage with the English surveyors who are giving all these botch names to beautiful Irish places as it turned out. Mm. Um, he, he speaks, he teaches and speaks very good Greek, but he doesn't have any English. Mm. Um, and these, this sets up, uh, from my mind, the, the thing that's haunted me all my writing life for 40 years. While I have this reverence for for Virgil, for Catullus, for Propertius, uh, and all the ones I connected with at school. I still think, I still have a sort of uh, sense of trying to go home to that barbarian world that didn't have these perfected languages, that didn't have languages capable of being set up into hexameters. Mm. Uh, I mean, what do you think that is that, yeah, and you t you write somewhere about the, do you know when, o when Odysseus kills the suitors and then they do terrible damage to the maids and all the rest, that you see that you saw, you understand that in a Greek way. I mean, and I've lived in Greece actually for a year in 1980. How have you ended up, Daniel, as this, with this, uncanny, inspiring, radiant, laser-like seeing into a language. I mean, is this common in, in, your, in the world of classicism or are you just wonderfully unique? No, I, I don't know. I mean, I think a lot of classicists have a, a kind of intuitive um, feel I guess you would say, for the languages and therefore the culture. It just feels right. It just feels right for them. Otherwise, why bother? You know, nobody is forcing anybody to, you know, do a PhD in Greek and Latin, you know. No. I think that um, it is a kind of a sense of a fit, you mm. know. I, People who end up being classicists. Look, I mean, on the you know, maybe I shouldn't say this during the opening event of our grand classics weekend, but you know, it's a very specialized field of study, becoming mm. more so by the minute. You know, as we as we abandon any sense of the past, um, and so you have to be a little bit odd, I think, to to get into this business in the first place. But it it is. You know, once you discover it, it just makes sense to you. I have, look, I see it in my students. You know, you can see that gleam in their eye when mm. this, not just the language, but the civilizations just make sense to somebody for whatever reason, you know. Look, there are people, as you know, Helen was talking about my book about my dad. My father was a mathematician. So we know about this from our own experience. Some people are good in math. Some people aren't. Mm. You know, it's a kind of a temperamental thing. And I think people who have a feel for the classics, who feel the allure of these civilizations mm. are drawn to it for whatever reason. And then they they follow the path wherever it takes them. 
I mean, mm -hmm. I admire it so much in the, it because of this dark inability. I mean, to read the Aeneid took me an entire summer of slogging my way through the vocabulary. I think at one point I gave you uh, my copy, my working copy of the Aeneid, which, which bears all the signs of that struggle. But, but rather thrillingly, I noticed you mentioned in passing somewhere, and I, first of all, you, you talk about those very Greek participles are the very things that Horace didn't have when he was trying to bring the hexameter into Latin, right. which made it really difficult, his achievement. But I notice you say in passing that Horace actually studied in Athens, is that correct, as a, as a young man? So he must have had the, how does that come about for Horace being in Athens? And is that because he had the same looking into Greek that you have? Well, I think, look, I mean, we know that, you know, for a certain kind of Roman, it was the thing that you did, you know, it's like, you know, we have this thing here, you know, your junior year abroad, you know, your, your third year at university, you go to Ireland or wherever and study. And certainly the, the Romans, the Romans revered Greek culture, had a very complicated relation to it. You know, they were the victors, they were the world conquerors, but they always uh, envied and admired the Greeks for the culture. Uh, and so that was the thing you did if you had some money and you were a Roman with a brain and an education, you did your junior year abroad, so to speak, in Athens. Actually, Kavafi has, a, the, the modern Greek poet, Constant King Kavafi, mm. has a wonderful poem called Horace in Athens. Um, <sighs> yeah, I'll send it to you. Oh, um, it's very, very charming. Um, so yeah, I think, uh, this reminds me of something that I wanted to talk to you about, and I want to sort of backpedal a tiny bit, Sebastian, uh, mm -hmm. and talk about, you know, when you were saying your difficulty, the difficulty yeah. that you had. And I always think, you know, this is worth, since we're on the subject of how you get interested in the classics, where it leads you in your life, the Romans are the great conquerors. You know, they are essentially unconquered, basically to the end of their civilization, which is remarkable. I always wondered, so I'm a Hellenist. I mean, I've, I've written about Roman literature. I've published about Roman literature, but I'm really a Hellenist. And I always wonder whether to some extent that's not because the Greeks were ultimately conquered by Rome. You know, the, Greek, the great Greek problem was they could never get their act together politically. You know, there are all these little city states with their own government. They're always very fighting. Very Irish, Don, very Irish. No, I know, very Jewish too, you know. Uh -huh. so, very Jewish. Uh, and I wonder whether my, so the Greeks were ultimately defeated by the Romans and that gives them equality I don't know, of maybe pathos at a certain point in the grand historical picture. You know, on the one hand, they have this extraordinary, innovative, ravishing culture that we all know about. And yet it didn't, it did not make them into a world power. And I wonder whether my identification with the Greeks is not somehow, you know, I'm just talking off the top of my head here, but it's not somehow politically inflected. You know, they're ultimately losers in a funny way. Um, and I don't know, I always found them much more sympathetic for some reason. I can never identify with the Romans, mm. you know. Um, yeah, and, you only have to look at the statuary and, and the, the wall paintings to feel a bit dismayed uh, at the non-Greekness. I mean, they built their city upon the old Greek city, as it were, in, in good old biblical style. Yeah. Um, but you know what you've said there actually is very uh, affecting because um, I think that's what I love about the Greeks. Uh, that's what I love about my own country. Although now there would be certain subtle exceptions to this statement, but in essence, we, we went through the 19th century and early 20th century without being an imperial power. Now in Trumpian terms, you could call that we were losers as you use the term. But I actually 
adore that about my country in that we built a literature um, mutatis mutandis, actually in that Greek style that we weren't going to um, go out upon the world and conquer mm. uh, with the wind in our sails being, you know, our literature and our gra greatness and our grandeur. Now that's a very violent simplification actually, because of course, at any time in the British army, a third of the soldiers were Irish. Uh, most of the people running the colony, the British, the British empire were Irish or at least a third Scots and Irish. So, you know, that it, that's true too. Um, actually, I wanted to ask you about that very thing. I mean, we have Seneca, the richest man in Rome after Nero. We have um, Horace being hand in glove with his patrons. Mm. Um, Virgil too. What you've, yeah, what you've just said. I mean, how do you feel about these literatures built on imperial impulses and unashamedly offering them their poems and their epics as as great platforms for further uh, destruction, I suppose. I mean, destruction if you're being destroyed by them, but conquering if, if you're a conquering, if you're a well, Roman. I guess I have two thoughts, and one I want to backtrack to what you were just saying about Ireland. I So, uh, as you know, I'm also a translator of modern Greek poetry. Mm. Um, I've always I've always been struck, you know, since we're painting in broad strokes here, I'm going to yeah. throw out my crazy theory and, but nobody please don't quote me on Twitter. No, um, no, we're completely yeah. alone. Nobody will hear this. I've always been fascinating by this, by this phenomenon, which will lead me in my usual roundabout way to answering your question about how did these great poets of the Roman empire justify their connection to the political uh, political imperialism but you know modern ireland and, Mo and greece contemporary greece are two countries that throw out i think it is fair to say an unusually high number of great poets in relation to the size of the country and their world you know their place in the world and i think that has something to do with being a people that has been in history at various points subjugated. Mm. You know, because language becomes the only weapon in your arsenal. Mm. And I've always been struck, uh, I, I don't know, you know, whether people in the audience are aware, but, you know, modern Greece, Greece since the, since the um, liberation of Greece in the early 19th century has thrown off an incredible number of great poets. Mm. Um, which is strange for a small country that doesn't have a lot of world influence. And mm. I've thought about this a lot. And you know, there were under 500 years, they were under 450 years under Turkish Ottoman domination. I wonder if there's some connection there where mm. everything becomes about the language because mm. there is no other means of wielding identity and power. And that brings me now to the question that you were getting at. So if we're talking about Rome, some of the greatest, po the greatest poets of the Augustan age, I know you're interested in Horace. I've been interested in Virgil, whose Aeneid, which is a poem that we're both interested in, has been incredibly problematic for people who are worried about the, the relationship of free pro poetic expression to politics because the Aeneid is the poem that, according to the legend, is commissioned by Augustus, the first emperor, to celebrate the establishment of the Roman Empire, mm. an empire that wields power as ruthlessly as any empire in history. And so what, do you, what is the story you tell yourself if you're a great poet serving power? And both Virgil and Horace, the two greatest poets of the Augustan age are implicated in ways that have driven, you know, many a classicist crazy over the years in imperial power. They're friends of Augustus, you know, 
um, I mean, really friends with the emperor. And yet it's certainly in the case of Virgil, they're writing poetry that is, can be seen as serving the imperial agenda. So what do you do about that? That's one of the great questions that's haunted the Aeneid virtually since mm -hmm. the day it was published. Um, but my own feeling is that poet, great, you know, great poetry is always subversive, cannot not be subversive because any great poem is an instigation to reflection on something. And so the, if you look at the Aeneid, for example, yes, on the one hand, there's all these scenes about how great Rome is going to be, you know, these parades of as yet unborn Roman hero, real, you know, historical figures, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And yet there's other elements of the epic that strongly uh, suggest the presence of a critique of imperial domination. The famous story of Dido in book four, the lover mm -hmm. of Aeneas, who gets tossed aside, you know, when when she served her purpose. So I think, you know, it is possible to construct, uh, so to speak, an imperial poetry that simultaneously raises questions about the political arrangements that are necessary for an empire to succeed. Um, my my anxiety is that, um, I mean, as I also tried to write poetry when I was younger, and still to some degree would like to keep trying, um, obviously Pound's job was to break the pentameter and we have a, a different world not as metrical as other literatures but at the same time there is a sort of profound answer in this very synaptic nature of the human mind to meter and when it's when it's done with such as I suspect beautiful ease in Homer and then similarly Virgil taking it up, then there is some answering joy in the human mind. So my anxiety is, my, my anxiety is a question, it would be a question like, do perfected meters need perfected societies? Can, and I mean, Kavafi, whom you've, in, the whole of Kavafi you've translated, and I, I, I dread to think what your IQ is, Daniel, but never mind, let's leave that alone. Um, he's living in this kind of provisional post Greek world, isn't he in his time? And, and yet is as, as expansively great as anyone you can mention in the whole of literature. Um, is that, I mean, can the barbaric soul such as my own, the provisional soul, the unreconstructed citizen soul trying to be a citizen, can that person actually make a permanent literature? That's the question, Daniel. Can we make something as permanent as the Aeneid, as the Odyssey? Well, you can, I think, but you know. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, I, here's how I want to think about I'm going to evade your question in a very fascinating way, okay? God, <laughs> because I can't answer it. So, you know, in part, the, the, what you're interested in, I think, is getting at, in a very funny way, gets at a, a fundamental question about the classics and the role and the nature of the classics, which is what we're here to talk about and obviously celebrate this weekend, um, which is about the relationship of an imperfect culture to an extremely beautiful literature. Mm. That's how I want to put it. So, mm. as you know, and I know that there are um, the classics teachers and classics students in the audience. And I think this is one of the most interesting aspects of classics. Certainly it was not something that was greatly discussed when I was a undergraduate student in the late 1970s and early 80s. I mean, that recently, uh, you know, which is the fact that these are civilizations that produced remarkable, remarkably sophisticated, and one just has to use the word, beautiful culture in many ways, in the, in the arts, in, in obviously literature, 
philosophy, science, and yet they are both cultures that are deeply uh, flawed in many of the ways that we now talk about as a matter of course, but only relatively recently in the history of classics as a discipline. These, you know, both Greece and Rome are unbelievably um, patriarchal. Women are at best second-class citizens, made to be invisible, can't own property, blah, 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 blah. Right, slave, they're, they're cultures that are, they're, both economies are completely dependent on enslaved people, hmm. um, you know, so, that's what, in a very, I think, um, healthy way, these aspects of classical civilization are now front and center in our discussions of them. Mm -hmm. I, as a, you know, I'm a middle child, so I'm always trying to be the reconciler, you know. So, mm -hmm. so one has to acknowledge that there is a complexity in the very act of studying these civilizations, which is there are things that we admire tremendously about them and that have contributed or created some of the very greatest works that we know of, hmm. apart from the fact that they're the origins of Western civilization and blah, 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 that, you know, all of that stuff, which is itself a huge consideration. But you know, they create these extraordinary works that continue to have unbelievable resonance. My look at the roster of events for this mm -hmm. weekend. You know, Antigone is still speaking to us. Mm -hmm. It hasn't stopped speaking to us for 2,500 years. Mm -hmm. And it's not just because of a conspiracy of, you know, syllabus creators since the year 404 <laughs> BC. You know, there is something about it that is genuinely great, that irresistibly needs to keep talking to us. So how do you reconcile it with the fact that the bases of these cultures mm. involve institutions which are incredibly repugnant to us as modern people? That's mm. a great question. I'm always, as I said, I'm a middle child, so I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, you know. Mm. And I think, you know, I'm speaking here to the students in the audience, you know, one of the great things about this, as it were, problematic of being a classicist or being interested in classics is it forces you to accept complexity. It forces you to understand negative capability, you know, to hold two contrary ideas in your mind, which is mm. these words, civilizations that in many ways were terrible mm. and the terribleness of which many people for the first time are really grappling with mm -hmm. and yet are also great. And I think yeah. there may not be a resolution, but the problem is interesting. You well, know? We, we may be a terrible creature with certain little glittering golden addenda that are, are more in our favor. Yeah. Um, I mean, you talked, you, when you're writing, I think in an odyssey about your, your father, um, or possibly in your new book, Three Rings, you say that, um, you know, sometimes he, he could say terrible things, but at other times he could be very gentle. And maybe we should reduce the sometimes accidental imperialism of these poems back down to the, the central things that are given to us actually as valuable guides through the underworld of normal life, you might say. And uh, in your case, it's, I mean, without him wandering into your class at Bard when you were teaching the Odyssey, do you think, Daniel, you could have come to that incredible understanding of your father with all his contradictions and glories? Would that have been yours to know without that process of the of no, this? This is, yeah, I'm really happy you brought this brought this up because that that book of mine and the way that experience, you know, which on the face of it is kind of a comic setup, you know, your 82 year old father shows up in your undergraduate class one day as a student, you know, it's, it, it is a comedy, right? But it forced me to grapple with the oddity in a way that 
I really had never done before. And this goes to the heart of the, as I'm referring to it, you know, the problem of classics. So, because throughout my book, An Odyssey, I'm recalling the way in which my father, through his grumpy interruptions in, you know, during the class, you know, the, the sort of punchline of the book is that I could never get my father to like the Odyssey. He couldn't stand the Odyssey and he, particular, he particularly couldn't bear Odysseus as a hero. He kept walking around saying, I don't understand why he's supposed to be so great. He lies all the time, you know, so he cheats on his wife. What's so great about that, you know? And, and, but that goes to the heart of what I'm trying to talk about. And, and here again, I'm thinking particularly of students you know, in the audience, which is about the virtues of complexity. You know, Odysseus is a character who has fabulously alluring attributes and also extremely unpleasant ones. You know, he's charming. He's, he's writers love Odysseus because he's a great storyteller. You know, he's the first great author, you know, in, in the Western tradition, he spins tales to stay alive, you know, uh, and yet he is awful in many ways, you know, always remember wherever Odysseus goes, he leaves destruction and heartbreak behind. There isn't a single place that he goes in his adventures where he doesn't somehow destroy it. You know? Dido burning on her pyre. Well, that's the forerunner of Dido. These great heroes, they cannot go anywhere without causing trouble. That's something to think about. And I don't think Virgil wasn't aware of that, you know, mm. or Homer for that matter, whoever he was. Mm. So, so I'm saying this because in my book, An Odyssey, I'm sort of always both implicitly and explicitly paralleling or mirroring Odysseus and my father, who was another, as it were for me, certainly towering character who had both marvelous and ugly qualities. And you know what? I hate to say it, that's life. That is life. And one of the great, so I wanna take the problem of the classics, both the study of the classics, the civilizations themselves, but also individual works, which torment us because they're so beautiful and so ugly at the same time. The cultures are so produce so much beauty, beauty that we have internalized as Westerners and Europeans, you know, and also was based on so much ugliness. And I want to think about these characters like Odysseus, like Aeneas, one of the most problematic characters in the Western canon mm. and tell you that's the point. You know, it's not about resolving. You know, I think, you know, I have a sort of running joke with my friends that the, the dirtiest word in the English language lately is closure. You know, yeah. everybody wants closure all the time. There is yeah. no closure. You have to be able to entertain the fact that your father can be great and terrible at the same time. That's life. Yeah. And that's what I want my students I don't want them to figure out a way to make Odysseus wonderful. I want them to appreciate the fact that greatness can coexist with terribleness and often does. You know, so many of the political controversies or the cultural controversies of our time, particularly with respect to university, you know, higher education, are about the inability to fact, I think, the factor in the fact that greatness and terribleness often come in the same package, you know. But you want your, t you want your students, and I presume you do love teaching, uh, if you had to summarize your feelings for a teacher, but you want your students also, don't you, Daniel, to, to take these works personally, in the sense that you know, for somebody like me who has no relationship with his father, to read your book, An Odyssey, this is where I came in with you, I think. This is why we are, I hope and pray, friends. It's overwhelming for somebody to particularize that duality. And yet, at the end of the noticing, let's not call it a resolution, 
you are more than content. You are more than happy in your book to essentially to carry your father on your back, you know, like Aeneas and, and Kisses. Basically, don't you want your students to have that sort of person? I mean, when I was reading Catullus and Propertius, for instance, I took them not as contemporaries, but as my teachers. And I felt that they were just, you know, Propertius was just up the road in Assisi. I could go and see him if I needed to, because his world was so new. His world was so of the moment. I mean, would that be an ambition? I mean, that is, I think, the nature of your teaching. If I Tell me if I'm wrong. It could be. I mean, look, I want, uh, I, I, I'm a teacher of literature, in this case, classical literature, but other literature too. I'm a reader of literature. I'm a very active critic of contemporary writing. And what do I want people to do? I want people to read deeply and appreciate the text. And if I think it's a great text, I really want my students, mm -hmm. I'm not gonna force them, but I hope that I'll teach the text in a way that at least allows them to perceive why people have thought it was great. Mm -hmm. Even if I can't get them to see that it is great. Mm -hmm. I, on the other hand, and you know, as you know, and people who are familiar with my criticism know, you know, the pieces that I write on a regular basis about movies, television, but you know, I'm always thinking of the classics as a sort of template, not that you have to imitate them, but they, because these works stand at the head of our own tradition, they provided blueprints, which in many ways we can't get out of our system. And that, I think, is another kind of key. You know, we began this conversation by talking about language as a key that opens up a culture. Mm -hmm. And the other thing about the classics, even if you don't like them, even if you're angry at those Greeks because they're horribly mm -hmm. patriarchal and they owned enslaved people, you have to deal with the fact that a lot of these works establish paradigms that have worked themselves so deeply into the DNA of our own civilization that you can't get away from them, and in order to appreciate many, you know, much of culture that isn't obviously associated with the classics, you need to know about them if you're yeah. in the business of literature. You know, there's a scene in my book where I recall how on this cockamamie Odyssey cruise, you know, my father started talking about the Wizard of Oz, the premiere of which he was taken to see in New York in 1939, right before the war started. And somebody asked my father, he said, or sorry, asked me, oh, is the, do you think the Wizard of Oz is an Odyssean text? And I said, of course it's an Odyssean text. Mm. You, know, you can't get away from this model. You leave home, you encounter these strange new places and people, you come home and your life is changed even though you're home. It's Star Trek. It's a million things, right? And it's also before the Odyssey, Gilgamesh and all those things. Yeah. It's, it's ancient stuff. And maybe the purest piece of information is still in the Odyssey or the Aeneid. That's where you go to get it, the source. I mean, you must have, you know, nobody notices Swinburne in early WB Yeats because nobody reads Swinburne, but it's still the influence is there. And you must read a thousand things and think, oh, that's straight out of Homer, but I bet the writer or the artist doesn't know. But it's, it, you know, as I say, it's part of the DNA. There's one more thing I wanted to say, which I think is the sort of flip side of this. So on the one hand, you don't have to love these cultures, but for better or for worse, they're out there. And if you engage with them, you so many things become clear to you. You know, you see these you know, it's like when you go to the eye doctor and you have to do a color blindness test and there's like the number 69 is hidden in a bunch of bubbles, you know, and and if you wear a certain color glasses, you'll see it, but otherwise not. It allows you to perceive things that are, as it were, hiding in plain sight. But I never want my students to just blindly genuflect before the great classics. You know, I want them to engage and in that sense i always remind them <laughs> that these guys at the end of the day were just writers you know we know what that's like and you know not everything was great i whenever i teach greek tragedy i always teach what i call the bad plays of euripides first you know he had some off days it wasn't all wonderful right you have to remember that you know 
Nobody who reads the children of Heracles is going to think that, you know, Euripides was on his game every day of the week, right? <laughs> and that's important too. You know, they're just guys who were writing and mm -hmm. want to understand under what conditions they were writing, what they thought they were doing, and to what extent these works still speak to us. And, and in truth, Daniel, lots of guys, not too many. Yes. There's no question. There's no question. Yeah. And that's one of the biggest things we have to factor in. Yeah. I mean, of these people, I mean, you've written, If I, I want to say before we probably have to turn um, to questions. Um, I've read your new book, Three Rings, three times. I mean, second, the first, second time, because it's very quite a difficult book. I mean, challenging for my um, brain set. Um, but this is a very passionate, um, permanent book to my mind, a sort of masterpiece that talks about Fenelon and Auerbach and Siebold in a sort of passionate, loving way that also pays attention, if I may say, to your love of melodrama when you were a younger man, as you confess somewhere, which you try to temper with your, with your, 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 your Greek, uh, your understanding of Greek, which I thought was very interesting too. But I mean, I feel that in being your friend, I always feel I'm about to be dismissed for my lack of qualification. Never mind, and maybe all friends feel that. Um, you, you are, in a sense, you have dinner with Fenelon, who is, after all, the, the age of Louis XIV, who wrote the great um, book of about Telemachus, which became probably the most famous book, didn't it, for uh, for 100 years in its time, um, and uh, Auerbach. Would you love, and I know you love traveling yourself, you are, in, in essence, a sort of Odysseus yourself, Daniel. Would you love to, if you were allowed to have a dinner party with these critters and Einstein's theory of time was proved correct and they're all still somewhere available. Who would you like to have around your table of, of the, the Greek and Romans? Well, I, I would say probably Euripides, but not Sophocles. Oh. Virgil, just because I would like to sit him down and ask him really how much he got paid, you know, to do the Aeneid, and was it worth it, you know? Uh, no, that's a hard question. That's a hard question. I, but uh, all kidding aside, I want to go back to your, I'm never going to dismiss you, because whenever I'm with you, I think, oh, Sebastian's a real writer and I'm just a phony, you know, so go. Yeah, I think that's a big major error you've made in your life, Daniel. It's you, just it's not it's, attention your teaching and, and you say other things, but actually your body of work is astounding. Let me just say that to the students and all the other people listening. And they must read The Lost, which is your great, great book about looking for the six members of your family who were, who were lost in the Shoah. And Three Rings is a very tremendous uh, achievement, which has just been published, I think, is it by Princeton or, or the University of Virginia? I can't quite remember. Yeah. Um, I mean, these are... And, and your wonderful book, The Elusive Embrace, Embrace, about understanding yourself as a younger man through the classics. I mean, these are classics. And I do believe, uh, this is why I, I, I fear for our friendship, you have written a number of classic books, Daniel. And I'm saying it not so much to you, but to the people listening, because you'll never believe me. Yeah, S said the laureate novelist of Ireland. All right, I think that's before, I feel like I'm at my bar mitzvah, you know, and you're... <laughs> And all the relatives are lining up to say nice things about me. So I think this is a very good time to go to <laughs> uh, before I start blushing. Um, but I do think, all kidding aside, I, I mm. always think of these people as writers, as living people yes. faced with the difficulties of writing. And as you know, every professional writer knows one thing, which is that every piece that you write is a series of problems that you need to solve. That's really what writing is about. With an organic element as well. Yeah, but I mean, with, that's with what truly a wrong idea of inspiration involved in it. But that's what they were doing. You know, every yeah. year in Athens, they had that drama festival and Euripides looked at his clock and he said, oh, Jesus, I have to do another tetralogy by the end of November. What am I going to do? And the Romans exactly the same. Drama totally depended on winning at the festival. Yeah. Or as you wave goodbye to your play for a hundred years, two hundred years, two thousand years. You know. 
Yeah. Let's, let's yeah. go to questions. If there are questions, usually my mother is the first person to ask a question whenever I do an event. Oh, God, she's not tuned in. I want to, her to ask me a question. Well, let me say, what, how, as Helen tees up with questions, um, the thing I have got from my tussle with, with Latin was an understanding that you could pack language without it seeming constrained. That uh, all my desire for 40 years has to be to, to make, if I can, at some point, a work that is so of itself that you, you that you cannot unpick the mystery of how it's made because you yourself don't have access to it. But it, that also involves being open to uh, the things you can't do. But each book is uh, an acquiring of a skill that you possibly just couldn't have. And that, that I think I stole through my, my, my possibly poor understanding of what the Romans were, were doing in their writing. Mm. So I'm entirely grateful to it. It's just my sheer thickness, my stupidest that, that, um, brain that prevented me from having the glorious uh, career that you've had since your um, <laughs> encounter with, with language. Otherwise, I'd be, I'd be competing with you there in Bard. Helen, do you want to come in? Yeah, I, uh, yes, I, I, um, I'd love to come in because we have we have lots of questions, uh, and uh, well, for both for both of you, and I'm going to just group a few together because there are some Daniel about very much about the future um, of the teaching, uh, the future for Latin and Greek mm. in university and in school curricula, and also there's also a related one about his the teaching of history. Um, and whether uh, it's in a better in a better um, state in the U.S. than it is <laughs> in particularly in the U.K. So a couple of questions there about your your feelings about I suppose the future of the discipline. Well, I think I mean there's a various ways to think about the issue. I mean there's no question. I can only talk about what's happening here, obviously. Um, I, on the one hand, <laughs> I'm going to do a very Greek answer uh, to this question. So on the one hand, um, yes, things are always looking bleak, uh, uh, particularly, I think, because, of course, of the uh, economic crisis that has uh, resulted from COVID and which is likely to be with us for quite some time. There will be a particular emphasis on uh, in higher education on uh, students studying things that are practical and that will pose further threats to humanities departments uh, and particularly things with, like classics which people are always very ambiguous about you know it seems so esoteric who needs to look at this stuff that's 3,000 years old um, so I think uh, here you know in the world of higher education we're constantly getting reports of classics departments being shut down, modern languages departments being shut down or being absor you know, absorbed into other departments. So I think there's something to worry about. That said, on the other hand, you know, Mary Beard, whom everybody knows, uh, gave a very funny lecture here in New York <laughs> a few years ago um, about the history of people thinking that classics was endangered. And it basically goes back to ancient Rome, which was the point of her art. You know, since Rome, people have been saying, nobody's studying the classics anymore. So I'm a little optimistic. And here I want to come full circle to the sort of autobiographical comment I made at the beginning of our discussion, which is there's always kids out there who for whatever crazy reason, are touched by this and interested in it. That I don't think is ever gonna go away. And that always gives me hope. So, you know, I think there's cause for concern, but I don't think there's cause for despair because at the end of the day, I think people acknowledge how central this material is to our own cultural self-understanding. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, 
I think so. I, yes, Mary Beard is very, very funny about that. Um, I, there's a question here um, for Sebastian uh, about your novels, about Sebastian, uh, what might be some ways you experience the presence or influence of the classics in your fiction that readers might not necessarily see? Good question. Well, I, I try to be as uh, obvious as I could be in naming in the first book of a series of novels I've written, um, the whereabouts of Ennius McNulty in, in naming him Ennius, because um, in, in some ways that novel, uh, while it's informed more by a memory of my struggle that summer with the Aeneid and the themes of the Aeneid is, is, um, is, is talking back to that poem. Mm. Um, because as an Irish person, um, mired as we all are in in Irish history, as opposed to to Greek history or Latin history, uh, Roman history, and um, the fact that the character in that book is obliged to undertake a journey of, because he has uh, sinned against the the status the the revolutionaries of his day in Ireland uh, by becoming policemen and all these other crimes on his head and he's obliged to wander, but he is obliged to wander from home. He, he is being, he's not going from Ithaca to fight um, in Troy or anything like that. He is, uh, he, is a, he is trying to always circle back to the home place. Mm -hmm. But as, as soon as he touches on it, he's, he's, he's obliged to go or he's told to go or he's threatened what will happen with what will happen to him if he doesn't go and all the my whole feeling about that book was that um, in a properly uh, inexact way it was my loving uh, conversation uh, with with Virgil's poem um, I, when I was a very young well when I was at Trinity I wrote um, I was very struck by passages of Propertius, you know, a little passage in Propertius about Vertumnus, uh, the god of a number of things, and I wrote a little poem about that, which was published in my first um, collection, The Watercolors by Dalman Press, and uh, I was basically very affected and by the whole thing, and it's in there because how could it not be, as Daniel says, it gets into your DNA, but in another strange way, and I think this is where we began in our conversation, Daniel, it's already in our DNA. This would be my suspicion about your understand, your uncanny understanding of Greek, is that it was already written into you somehow, DNA-wise, and there's no getting away from it. And as Daniel says, you can feel annoyed with the classics or you can condemn them one way or another as one can condemn Joseph Conrad, who was one of my heroes for his attitudes. But nevertheless, when you come to the text itself, the text is humane, the text is singing, the text is trying to uh, give you good reasons for being alive in, in, a, diff in a difficult world. Mm -hmm. And that's all my work has been really in some ways if I hadn't read stupidly, maybe that book by Matthew Arnold encouraging me to go and read the classics, I wouldn't have had a certain uh, element in my work, mm. uh, which has which has stood to me for the journey. You know, it has been a very good um, box of sandwiches for for the long journey. <laughs> yes. Uh there's a there's a question here. I, I, I think this is probably inevitable at this time uh, for Daniel uh, about uh, U.S. American politicians. What figures from the classical world are you reminded of by the most prominent current U.S. politicians, and in what ways? Well, I mean, there it's funny. Uh, 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 so. Obviously, you know, there's actually been an extraordinary amount of writing about Trump uh, as a, and comparisons to various uh, figures from both Greek history and I would say also Greek literature um, as well. Um, the, 
you know, the uh, when he was elected, I thought immediately of the the demagogues who arose uh, in the latter part of the Peloponnesian War. You know, here again, uh, the question in a funny way. So you can you can play this game. It's a favorite parlor game of classicists. You know, who is who like? You know, which character from history? And everyone has their own. Um, ideas, but what I like about the question is it goes back to the point that I was making, is that the paradigms are there and they're useful to, to think about. I mean, I could say, oh, you know, he reminds me of this character or that Cleon, the great demagogue who in many ways led Athens astray in the latter part of the uh, or middle to latter part of the Peloponnesian War, you know, um, uh, the the vulgarian Ariviste who takes over Athenian politics and by the the crude force of his speeches captures the mind of an easily swayed people. But what I like about the question is it, it sort of proves the point I was making is there's an almost irresistible urge to find the classical prototype. You know, I, I mean, it works both ways. I remember when, when the Gulf War started, you know, both the anti-war and pro-war side were trying to claim Thucydides as a justification for their completely opposite, you know, uh, uh, points of view. So I like the question because it just reminds you that this is an irresistible urge. There, these models are out there and they can be useful to think about. They can't, which, they chapter, which chapter of Gibbon are we in, Daniel? Pardon? Which chapter of Gibbon's decline and fall <laughs> are we in? <laughs> Very far along. <laughs> ah, yes. I think Nero. I think we're with Nero. <laughs> well, much um, more than that, I'd say. Um, there's, a, there's a question uh, quoting uh, Zanakis, the Greek composer of the Oresteia, often said, I'm a classical Greek living in the 20th century. Do you share the same feelings? Well, I think I think probably a Greek can have greater claim to that statement than a non-Greek. <laughs> you are a Greek, Danny. <laughs> I I've just always felt from the beginning of my writing career. Look, I went to I did a PhD and I thought I would become a professor, and instead I became a writer. It's only later in life that I went back into the university world. But I, and I was in, I was at university doing my PhD at a very sort of uh, fervid moment in the sort of theory era at, for which I had no taste or talent. You know, everybody was deconstructing things and I had no idea what that meant and I still don't know what it means. Uh, and so I exited the academic world, but I carried with me this, feeling that I've been talking about during this whole hour, that this material seemed to me to be so great, so interesting, so alive, you know, not dusty uh, at all. And to spoke to me so forcefully that I just wanted to be able to write about it for people, not for academics, although if they like it, I'm happy, but it's like teaching. You love this stuff and you want your students to love it and you will do anything basically. You know, before we went on the air, I said, you know, I'll make balloon animals if necessary. You know, I will do anything to get people to see what I at least think is so fascinating about this. And that's what I've just been doing my whole career. And one of the ways I do it is to weave these considerations or reflections on classical texts, like this grammatical thing I was talking about before, and to hold it out in front of people and say, you know, yes, it's 2,500 years old. Yes, the gadgets have changed. Yes, now we have iPhones and they didn't. And But you know what? Mutatis mutandis, to use the famous Irish expression, <laughs> you know, not much has changed about human nature. And that's why it's always true. It's always true, not just classics. I mean, all great literature is always true. And because Dan, we're only 200. Human nature is the one thing that hasn't 
Now, we're only 200,000 years old as a creature anyway. So actually, Homer's quite recent. Yeah, and so in that sense, yeah, maybe I am a Greek in the modern <laughs> world. Yeah, there's, a, there's yeah. A, question, a question for the for the two of you, which is that you've, you've mentioned, you've touched on uh, Homer and uh, Virgil, and this is wondering about other, other classical authors or t particular texts that are very important to you in a personal way or that you've turned to at particular times in your life that you would recommend to our viewers? Well, so when I was very young, um, I'm reading Horace, I loved the so-called satires and uh, ceremonies and I, I, I translated them. <clears throat> but now that I'm 65, much to my, and the odes meant nothing to me actually at 21, almost nothing. I detested them as being specious and I don't know what I thought about them, rather cliched. But now having lived a life, I can see that no, no, they're not cliches, they are eternal truths that he's actually, <laughs> and, that, and that's interesting to me that you can come at these writers from different times of your life and find different things. Well. But this, I mean, that raises one of the most interesting questions about one's relationship to literature, which is that you are a moving target. I, you know, I love writing about this, you know, things you love when you're young and as you get older, don't mean as much to you. You know, I always like to joke with my students, you know, when I was young, I loved Antigone and now I'm all about Creon. He gets better and better <laughs> as I get older. You know, not really. um, but that's also wonderful you know as you yourself journey through life different things speak to you differently it doesn't and that's good i would hate to have the same reaction to a, a poem at the age of you know obviously i'm much younger than sebastian i'm only 30. um kidding uh but you know so i think that's a good thing i always think to me the great the genre that i always go back to is actually greek tragedy you know we've been talking about epics mostly for various reasons, all of them good, but I'm actually, my my specialty is actually Greek tragedy. And to me, I love tragedy. And in I want to wrap this around to the question about modern American politics, believe it or not. But what I love about tragedy, and it's almost always the case in Greek tragedy, you know, the Greeks lived with death in a way that no modern Western civilization does. You know, we've distanced it, we've made it clinical, we've packaged it. And for that reason, I think they're very clear eyed about certain difficult things in life. And one of the things I've always, I think that attracted me to tragedy as the actual focus of my professional study is that all of Greek tragedy is about the fact that actions have consequences. You may try to ignore them. You may try to sweep them under the rug. You may lie about them. You may give them another name, but all of tragedy is about the moment when your actions come back to haunt you. And I, as an American, you know, I live in a culture in which people spend an extraordinary amount of time trying to pretend that actions don't have consequences. You'll never get old, you'll never die. You invade countries, but it's their problem. It's not your problem. And I think, you know, one of the things I love about tragedy is that it is about the fact that everything you do will return to you, whether you like it or not. And to me, for me, that's uh, that's the genre I always go back to. I think it's thrilling and I think it, it really is necessary. It's a necessary genre. Thank you, thank you. We're, and, and I'm going to say at this point that we have a, a, a major focus on uh, Greek tragedy in, in this Classics Now yeah. weekend. Oh. Um, on, on Sunday, we'll be looking at new versions of Antigone and also with Marina Carr, and who has returned to Greek tragedy and myth time and time again, as a lot yeah. of Irish, Irish playwrights and writers have. So, And that, it also ties in with the question we have about women in antiquity and whether they 
whether women have sufficient focus uh, in the study of classics. I mean, are this are we gowned? We're all, we're all we're women all we're women all the way pretty much uh, after to, to, today. Uh, but it's a it is a it is a question, um, and that it's about the fact that many of the undergraduates studying classical studies and classics are women, um, and and whether you think Daniel there should be that should be reflected more in the curriculum. Well, I, I, I mean, this is such an interesting question. So obviously, as I said, both Greece and Rome were deeply patriarchal cultures. So if you're a woman studying them, that's going to give you an interesting angle because women were repressed in these cultures, as we know, as everyone knows, as everyone has known for a long time. I actually wrote my properly scholarly book about the role of women in Greek tragedy. Since I would say the past two generations, there have been a tremendous uh, influx, a healthy influx of both women scholars and attention to women's issues in tragedy. Um, you know, I mean, in classics. Uh, you know, it's a, and obviously, as everybody knows, there are now, for example, Emily Wilson's translation of the Odyssey, which focuses on, uh, you know, ostensibly elements of both translation and the Odyssey that male critics are incapable of seeing because they're men. I'm not sure I totally think that's um, the right way of looking at the enterprise, but so, yes, absolutely. It, but if you're studying classics, you know, as with the slave owning economies, you're studying civilizations which are extremely imperfect with respect to questions of gender. And one has to decide what one's orientation is going to be. But I was trained by two of the greatest contemporary classic women classical scholars, Jenny Strauss Clay as an undergraduate and Froma Zeitlin as a graduate student at a moment when feminist criticism of the classics was having a tremendous um, uh, currency and justifiably so. I guess I have a tiny bit of hesitation and it's not about women in classics, which I'm all in favor of and studying the role of women in ancient society, which I have done myself. I, the one, uh, I guess it's sort of a caveat. I don't know how to describe it. I, and it takes me back to my question, my, my point about complexity. You know, you have to find a way to relate to these cultures and, the punchline can't always be that they are imperfect in these different ways. And aha, I told you so. I get, so if you're studying classics, you're studying a patriarchal, two patriarchal societies. And whether you are a male classicist or a female classicist, that's something you have to deal with. Yeah. And certainly the presence of women scholars in classics revealed necessarily or helped to shed light on these issues of gender. I don't like the idea that only women are interested in gender in the ancient world or that only women are able to see the problems of gender in the ancient world. You know, I'm a guy who studied women in Euripidean drama. So I don't like to be reductive and also, I say this too as a gay person who spent my entire formative life not reading gay literature because it didn't exist. And that may have an influence on my answer to this question, but you always have to make a series of adaptations in reading and to adjust. And so it's a problem, you know, gender is a problem in the study of antiquity. And I welcome any scholar who wants to grapple with that, certainly, Feminist scholarship and female scholars have done a huge amount, I would say in the past 45 years, to open this up as a subject. And that has to be reflected in the curriculum.
Absolutely. Dan you, Dan, you said that you met yourself first in, in a way, or a version of yourself in Mary reading Mary Reynolds or Reno. Oh, yeah. And wrote to her when she, she was living in South Africa, I think, and you wrote to her a huge correspondence with her. Yeah. So, you know, you know, but I, I guess what I'm interested in is this question of identification. I, I, if you if you are looking to identify with the works of classical literature on a one-to-one -one basis, finding yourself in them, finding it's going to be harder if you're a woman, I think. You know, because as we said before, almost all of these texts are by guys, and even the women characters in them are fantasies of male writers. That in itself is a subject that many great women classicists have exploded and studied. You know, it's a complicated question. But sure, of course. Should it be in the curriculum? Yes. Should there be more women classicists? Yes, because every pair of eyes, every psyche sheds something new. And that we need. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you for our, for our question. That was a, re a really full full answer uh, to, I think, a question that can be sometimes be uh, a little glib. But thank you very much, um, Daniel. And I think I think this is a point for us to to pause and to uh, to I suppose refer to some of the other um, events that we're going to have over the weekend. Um, and certainly, we do we do have a focus on on myth. And we also have a focus on Greek language, which will pick up some, some, of the, some of the things that Daniel was saying earlier about it being a, a key and opening, opening a door when you learn Greek in particular. Um, we have Andrea Marcolongo tomorrow, Italian classicist and, and, and writer, writing, writing, talking about her new book, which is Nine Epic Reasons to Love Greek. Um, and we also have a dance company, Junk Ensemble, taking a myth from Ovid's Metamorphoses, the myth of Mira, and as in their own words, exploding the myth. So uh, in a beautiful film tomorrow afternoon. Tomorrow night, we're joining Natalie Haynes, uh, again, to talk about women in Greek myth on her new book in, in on her sofa in London. Uh, and then Sunday, we have more um, Irish playwrights and also, uh, all weekend, we have a, the new film of Antigone, directed by Sophie Derasp, uh, set in in Montreal. So, lots of coming out coming at these themes that we've that we've been touching on with Daniel and Sebastian in many many different ways. And I think I think that really reflects that idea, the notion of complexity that we were talking about. Because you 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 will come, your mind will be changed over the weekend as you listen to different writers and um, artists talking about their interpretation of of classics and it's multifaceted there is no and, and you will each you're building layer upon layer and you realize that we're we're part of a chain of, mm. of connection that that t reaches back into the past and also takes us into the future um but i i'd like to thank our two writers this evening sebastian Barry and daniel mendelson for opening up um, our weekend in such a such a stimulating way and so 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 thought-provoking um i want to thank everyone involved in this event this evening um this is in partnership with the laureate for irish fiction who is, of course is is sebastian um, and all the, the program of uh, of work that he's involved in and the manager of that is marcella bannon and i'd like to thank her in particular um, I thank thank the Arts Council funds Classics Now. So of course we we wouldn't be here without without that funding. So special, uh, a, a very uh, we're really appreciative of that. Um, Classics Now has a steering committee. I have uh, colleagues from three major universities in the in the Dublin area: University College Dublin, Trinity College Dublin, and Maynooth University, and the Classical Association of Ireland. And I'd like to thank Alex Thien, Martin Kuypers. Mavo Sullivan, Seamus O'Sullivan, Mavo Bryan, Seamus O'Sullivan. Sorry, Maeve. Um, and also uh, to to say that you know we've we've worked together and it's very very rewarding to be working with three universities because it opens up our audience to to students and and communicates the excitement uh, about classics and about um, classical studies and languages. So I'd like to I think. From here, we'll lots, hope you can join us over the weekend for month or more events on classicsnow.ie. But from me in Dublin, uh, I'd like to thank Daniel Mendelssohn and Sebastian Barry for a fantastic conversation.
Thank you. Thank you, Helen.